About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the U.S. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and I never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommate that even the drug dealers in the city were polite. But all of that changed in just a few minutes on one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a short side street in order to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street on my side was the silhouette of a man, dancing. It was a strange dance similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky, and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still, until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild, head tilted back slightly, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glanced back, and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again, but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments, I felt relieved until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked that I stood there for some time, staring at him, and then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated tiptoe steps, as if he was a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or my cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there, completely frozen as a smiling man crept towards me. Then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling, his smile still looking at the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, What the fuck do you want? In an angry, commanding tone. What came out was more of a whimper. What? What the f- Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what I felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly, and started dance walking away. Just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go, until he was far enough away to be almost out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger. 
He was coming back my way, and this time he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that night, and I never went out on another walk. There was something about his face that will always haunt me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very, very scary thing to see. It was my first time staying home alone while my whole family was out at my brother's ball game. I think I was around 13. Anyways, I'm on the phone with a friend of mine feeling so grown up when somebody beeps in on the other line. I tell her I'll be right back and click over. Then the creepiest voice I have ever heard says, Hello little girl, I'm the man in your basement. Honestly, I laughed it off and just hung up thinking it was a prank call. I was a pretty confident little thing, my neighborhood was pretty safe, so I figured someone was just messing with me, knowing it was my first time alone. They beeped in again, so I clicked over and heard, Don't you fucking hang up on me, you little bitch. And the lights started flickering and there was a banging under my feet. I know it sounds crazy, but my dog started freaking out and my cat ran away, so I assure you I wasn't imagining a thing. Our basement was actually just an area connected to the garage. It wasn't finished. I heard what sounded like footsteps coming up the garage steps to get into our kitchen, and I threw stuff in front of the door and started yelling and whatnot. I kept trying to hang up and call the cops, but every time I tried to, he was still on the phone. My friend told her parents what was happening they ran to a neighbor's house to call the police for me. I sat petrified with a broken rifle, a butcher knife, and a baseball bat behind my front door because it's the only place in the house downstairs that couldn't be seen from a window. Eventually, I clicked over to hear a police dispatcher on the phone and stayed on the line with her until the police got to my house. There was no sign of forced entry, though we had a broken window pane on our outside garage door that had been messed up for months prior, and I, my guess was he had used that to get in. Police assumed I was just a paranoid girl, and they were going to leave me alone after they gave it all clear. Fortunately, a family friend had been driving by and saw the cops there and stopped by to see if everything was okay. He gave me a ride to the school where my family was. They were skeptical that anything had happened, but we did get a security system not too much longer after that, and my parents both got cell phones too. This was in 1994, I think cell phones weren't so popular yet. After that happened, I swear there was someone stalking me for years. I would leave my apartment locked and bolted and come back to find appliances on and the heat on in the middle of summer. I lived in four different places and would get strange phone calls at everyone despite being unlisted. Cars would randomly be parked down the road from a house and speed up and slam on the brakes as I would run inside. I'd hear loud bangs outside when I lived out in the country. Nothing has happened since I've been in my current house and married, but I am still super paranoid all the time. When I was in high school, my friends and I had a peculiar pastime. Like any teenage delinquent, we liked to cause trouble. We weren't vandals, we didn't deal drugs, and we certainly didn't bully kids in school, no. We liked to scare the living shit out of new parents by hacking their baby monitors. We were insufferable little punks who thought we were too good to get caught, and that our little acts of mischief would go unpunished. One night, however, I learned my lesson and realized that I wasn't quite as bulletproof as my tremendous adolescent ego made me out to be. Dimitri, Kurt, and I went to the same school, shared many of the same classes, and hung out almost every evening after chow time. We watched prank shows, played video games, and talked about who had the nicest rack in school. One evening, we were trading scary stories at the park. Kurt shared the classic story about the single mother who had heard a haunting voice over her baby monitor. Like most horror stories, it sounded like total bullshit. 
but Dimitri told us it had happened to his mom once. On her own monitor, she'd heard a neighbor singing to her baby. Apparently, it was possible to accidentally tap into someone else's frequency. In an instant, a light bulb turned on in each of our own heads. When you're close enough to someone, you don't need words to know exactly what that person is thinking, and we could all tell what we were thinking at the exact same time. We were going to buy a baby monitor and screw with people. Pardon the pun, but hacking a baby monitor is child's play. All you need to do is find a device on the same frequency as yours. Never want to do things half-assed, I purchased a high-end monitor with a frequency dial so we could prank as many targets as possible. The following night, we took our bikes, roamed the neighborhood, and found our first victim. We could see the nursery from the suburban home's second floor window. Dimitri grabbed the baby monitor and began turning it to different frequencies until we heard breathing. I remember feeling excited as our plan finally came to fruition. Dimitri pressed the button and began exhaling heavily into the receiver. Your little girl was delicious, he murmured using a demonic voice. The light in the master bedroom turned on almost immediately and we heard a shrill scream. Laughing our asses off, we quickly rode off down the street so we wouldn't get caught. We repeated the prank several times over the course of the following weeks, each taking turns talking through the monitor. Not wanting anyone to get wise to our little game, we chose different houses every time. People's reactions were priceless. Some mothers would reply in a panic, others seemed to know it was a hoax and told us to shut the hell up. And one poor woman even started sobbing uncontrollably, begging us not to hurt her baby. I feel bad about the last one now that I'm older, but it was hilarious to me back then. My friends and I mimicked her high-pitched bawling and desperate cries for mercy for weeks afterwards. Yeah, we were royal dicks. Karma's a bitch, and I got what was coming to me one night. Kurt and Dimitri were busy studying for their midterms, so I went out on my own. By then, we got pretty much everyone in the surrounding area, so I decided to venture off across the town into unfamiliar territory. Finding a target wasn't difficult, you just had to look for cars with baby seats, houses with overly colorful cartoon-themed curtains, or toys left in the yard. I came across a house that fit all three criteria, and parked my bike out of view. Playing with the tuner, I eventually found the right frequency. I could hear the sound of a baby snoring very lately. A devious little smirk pushed its way onto my lips, and my heart began pounding with excitement. It was my time to shine. I am watching, I whispered into the monitor, using the creepiest voice I could muster. The house remained dark and lifeless. I figured the homeowners hadn't heard me. I stand over your bed, watching, waiting. I will get you. I said louder this time. Nothing. Just the sounds of crickets chirping and the occasional dull roar of a car driving down the street. It was a little odd. Parents usually reacted much quicker than that. I began feeling a little nervous and somewhat exposed. You know, like when you suddenly realize some creepers gawking at you? It was getting late and I had a long bike ride home. Just as I was about to get up and leave, I heard a strange, moist gurgling sound coming from the monitor. The quiet, rhythmic snores ceased, and I assumed the baby had woken up and was about to start crying. Instead, a man spoke to me. You're the one being watched now, one. He said softly. My stomach pirouetted at his words. How did he know my name? I felt sick. Something was very wrong, and I could feel it in my bones. I glanced up at the nursery window and saw the silhouette standing there watching me. Had he been there watching me the entire time? The air was thick and difficult to inhale, though perhaps fear was making it hard to breathe. My body quivered uncontrollably as a sense of dread poured over every inch of me. I climbed on my bike, pedaling desperately to get away. Part of me thought I was overreacting, but the overwhelming need to flee overpowered my rational mind. You 
can't run. I know where you live, Juan. Continued the man, even as I turned the corner. I flew down the street, not stopping until I reached a busy boulevard. Surrounded by cars and a few late-night joggers, I felt safe. Your hoodie will run out of red with your blood, boy. Whispered the man, still talking through the baby monitor in my pocket. A passerby gave me a nasty look as I yelled loudly in fear, practically ripping my hoodie in my frantic attempt at removing it. To the stranger, I must have looked like some snotty kid tripping balls or something. He didn't know I was in genuine distress, so I don't blame him for walking off with an insulted huff, though I wish he'd offered to help me instead. After stuffing the hoodie into my backpack, I noticed my name scrawled on the back. It was my fucking school jacket! No wonder why that bastard knew my name. It then occurred to me that baby monitors were fairly short range, so I was obviously being followed. I nervously glanced around to try and identify my stalker. Was it the empty looking van down the street? That guy walking his dog? The car that had just driven by? Either way, the last thing I wanted was to hear that voice again, so I turned off the device and started pedaling towards home. Fear had heightened my senses, and I began to notice every motion of the trees in the breeze, every crackle of twigs under my wheels, and every car that zipped past me. I flinched whenever anyone came near, paranoid that whoever had spoken to me through that baby monitor was going to catch up. Fortunately, I made it home without incident. I parked my bike in the garage and crawled up the stairs to my bedroom. In one careless motion, I tossed my backpack and the baby monitor in the corner of my room and dove under my sheets like an Olympic swimmer. It doesn't matter how old you are, nothing feels safer than being under your blanket. I closed my eyes, hoping I'd be able to calm down enough to catch a few hours of rest before class. But then I heard static coming from the monitor across my room. The monitor that was supposed to be off. Sweet dreams, Juan, said the voice that still haunts my nightmares. Needless to say, I didn't sleep a wink that night. I was too frightened to get out of bed until sunrise. When I got up, my first order of business was to remove the battery from the monitor and throw it in the trash. I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. I came up with an excuse to get my buddies so they wouldn't think I was a huge pussy. With massive bags under my eyes, I got dressed, had breakfast, and went to school. It wasn't until a few days later I saw the house in the news. In an interview, a police officer explained that the small family who had been living in the house had been found under their beds, necks slid open. I had been outside when it happened. The killer had heard me on the baby monitor and decided to fuck with me. It was definitely a wake-up call, and I thank my lucky stars I hadn't gotten the shit murdered out of me. I was too busy feeling thankful that I survived to feel bad about the family that had it. Empathy, like wisdom, comes with age. Now that I'm an adult with a wife and a daughter, I truly understand the consequences of my actions, and the severity of the situation I put myself in as a tremendously stupid teenage boy. That dreadful night, I thought I reached the epitome of fear, but it was just the tip of the iceberg. As a father, I now know that fear thrives and multiplies when there's something more precious than your own life at stake. I can't say for sure whether the killer found me again after all these years, or whether a new breed of idiots had the same idea as my friends and I, but I can tell you now that I understand what true terror is. Last night I heard something on our baby monitor that sent chills into my very soul, shackling me with a paralyzing fear that I doubt will ever leave me.